Well met by moonlight, dear ones. I am Curiosity, and this is my jamboree. A firelight gathering for explorers of the uncanny, the frightening, and the hard to explain. Tonight we spin tales of playing cards, suspicious SUVs, and the strange feeling of being unwelcome in our own homes. So, settle in by the crackling fire, lean in close, and try to ignore the strange sounds of the forest behind you. Let us begin. Our first story was found on r slash butterfly effect, submitted by user Real Session 2370 There are a lot of stories on here about how the flip of a coin, the roll of a die, or some other insignificant or random thing can affect, save, or take a life down the road. Things where it isn't really a decision you'd made that came up later, but pure chance. This is one of those, and is the story of how my life was saved by the Ace of Clubs. My friends and I, six of us in total, had travelled to a convention in Manchester. We got a couple of hotel rooms between us, and were pretty packed in. It was a sci-fi convention, and for most of us, me included, it was our first, and we had a great time. We were there for the whole weekend, between the convention, the hotel, travel, and all the merch we bought. It was pretty expensive, and most of us were students, so we weren't exactly loaded. Still, we'd been planning for a year. I can't speak for anyone else, but I'd been saving up from my part-time job at a restaurant. There were two cars between us, and fortunately one was pretty big, so it had room for all the merch. We couldn't decide who wanted to go in what car, and you can imagine a group of nerds coming out of a great convention. We really wanted to rave about what a great time we'd had. The two friends with cars were Steve and Catherine, not their real names, and Catherine decided to use a deck of cards to decide who'd be in what car. Red cards for her, black cards for Steve. The idea was, since it was such a long journey, with a rest stop halfway through, we could swap cars after the halfway mark. Catherine shuffled her deck of Star Wars playing cards. I did say we were nerds, and we each drew one. I got the Ace of Clubs. Fine by me. I wouldn't have minded either way, and I'd be swapping to Catherine's car later on. Catherine's was the bigger car, and, as luck would have it, filled with the fewest people. Three of us had drawn black cards, and only one of us had drawn a red card. So Catherine's back seat and boot trunk for Americans were filled with our luggage and a fair amount of merch. I put my two full bags of merch on the seat behind Catherine and got into Steve's car. We set off with a four-hour drive ahead of us. It was getting pretty close to the halfway mark and there were some decent looking services on the motorway, so I texted Catherine to let her know we'd be pulling in. Steve's car is ahead by a couple of cars at this point, bear in mind. So we exited the motorway, onto the ramp, and pulled into the services. Just as Steve took his keys out of the ignition, we heard a bang like nothing I'd ever heard before, and people in the car park of the services were screaming and pointing. We got out and looked back towards the road. Somehow, Catherine's car had been slammed into full speed by a gigantic fucking lorry, and had spun around, coming to an abrupt stop in the lay-by. It seemed pretty safe. Not that we really cared at that point, so we all rushed over. I still had my phone in my hands, so I called 999 to get an ambulance out. I remember feeling like my stomach had fallen out of me when I saw the state the car was in. The back half of the driver's side had completely caved in. I don't mean the door was busted, I mean you could see the structure of the car. The metal had buckled and in some places shattered. The lorry driver had pulled over and was running towards us at this point. I can't tell you how much time slowed down as we ran over, with me breathlessly on the phone to emergency services. By some miracle, both Catherine and Bobby, the only other person in the car, were by now stumbling out, having fought off airbags and their seatbelts. Bobby's door on the passenger side was swinging open as the frame had crumpled away from it in the crash. I got them both to sit down on the side of the road and calm down. Shock's a serious thing, and I've heard horror stories of people who were fine one minute and passing out the next. And with something this serious, there was every chance of internal bleeding. I'm first aid trained, can you tell? 
I needed to look them over before the ambulance arrived to make sure there wasn't any visible bruising. The lorry driver was beside himself, but Steve was keeping him calm. The guy was trying to come over and see if everyone was alright, but I gave Steve a stern look that said, no. I was trying to keep Catherine and Bobby calm, and someone flapping a desperate apology at them wouldn't help. Two ambulances and two police cars showed up not long later, with a fire engine about 15 minutes after that. While the police took statements from everyone, starting with the lorry driver, paramedics looked over Catherine and Bobby. Nothing broken, no signs of internal bleeding, but Jesus, anyone driving past who caught sight of the wreckage of Catherine's car would definitely have guessed that this was a fatal collision. Once the paramedics were looking everything over, I took a closer look at the car. The word write-off didn't even begin to cover it. The tire on the driver's rear side had even burst, or possibly deflated. I know more about human first aid than car first aid. As I was inspecting the wreckage, I saw something familiar. The torn remains of a signed photo of Star Trek actor Michael Dorn. My signed photo, that I'd got the day before after standing in line for most of an hour. It turned out that the lorry was going at 60 miles per hour, and slammed into the back of Catherine's car, just catching the rear driver's side door. But you know, at 60 miles per hour, and weighing as much as a lorry. The officer I spoke to was completely candid about it. Anyone sitting in the back of the car, particularly behind the driver's side, would be dead right now. No hope at all of survival. In fact, she said it was a miracle that the driver wasn't killed. If the lorry had hit the car, half a second earlier even, Catherine wouldn't be alive. Catherine and Bobby were fine, physically, but they were both visibly shaken for the rest of the day, both as white as sheets. Every now and then, while we had a pretty subdued Burger King and waited for Catherine's parents to come get us, Catherine would burst into tears. I can't imagine how terrified she must have been, but she told me later on that she kept reliving that couple of seconds. They'd felt like a lifetime as her car spun out of control. It would be almost a full year before Catherine got behind the wheel again, and I can't say I blame her. For the record, as far as I can tell, Catherine is an excellent driver. After a couple of months, we started joking about it, the close call. But even so, to this day, three years later, I've never told Catherine what the police officer told me about how close it had really been for her or for me. All I can say is, thank God for the Ace of Clubs. Thank you, OP, for that story. I'm really glad everyone was okay, but it does sound like a close call. Our second story was found on r slash Let's Not Meet, submitted by user Yellow Umbrella. Happened in 2019, but still in the back of my mind. I worked at a Chick-fil-A. That night I was supposed to close, but I left at like 8pm-ish. I already know I'm going to spend like 30 to 45 minutes driving around to my usual Pokemon stops. At 8pm on a Wednesday, there's some cars on the road, but not many. It's a smaller town with little police presence as not much crime happens here. I've done this before. I know which spots to go to. I'm driving to the spots I know I can reach from inside of my car. Just got off work from standing and being busy all day. I wasn't about to go walking around when it was dark out anyways. The places I know have little to no cars. I pull into the parking lot by the high school field, spin the stops and click on a few Pokemon. I get ready to pull onto the residential street. I'm kind of just sitting at the stop sign for a bit, no cars behind me. I'm not really in a hurry. Blinker. Then I turn left onto the street. I see two cars in front of me, an older white SUV and a sedan in front of that. They're about four blocks ahead. I notice the SUV isn't really in its lane. It's driving in the middle of the road like it wants to pass the sedan. It definitely could have just passed it. The road was really wide and no oncoming cars. I'm glancing down at my phone in the cup holder, trying not to go too fast. Then I notice the white SUV that was driving in the middle of the road is driving really slow on the shoulder of the road. 
Maybe they've noticed me, wondering what I'm doing. Maybe I'm weirding them out. I lock my phone and drive normally. I'm nearly behind the SUV now and it speeds up quickly, it takes a hard right turn onto a street. I see the SUV pull into a driveway. As I'm passing that side street, I see the SUV going in reverse, and now it's backing out of that driveway. I'm behind the other sedan now, at a four-way stop. In my rearview mirror, the white SUV is turning back on the street. It's now going to be behind me. The sedan waits its turn at the four-way stop, then turns left. I wait my turn, then go straight. I'm watching to see if the white SUV goes straight too. It does. The SUV had to wait its turn at the four-way stop, so I'm a good four to six blocks ahead on this residential street. I want to lose this car, so I'm going like 30 miles per hour while the speed limit is maybe 20 or 25. I turn behind the church strip mall. The church has a playground behind it, but it's pretty much an alleyway. I lost the SUV. I stopped in the alley, waiting, looking in my side mirror, and sure enough, the white SUV is barreling down the street. It almost passed me it was going so fast, but it spots me and turns into the alley where I'm parked, coming towards my car. I'm freaked out at this point. The alley is dark, there's no street lights, the stores in the strip mall are abandoned but the church is on the other side and well lit, so I want to go there. I speed down the alley and around the building. The SUV is doing the same thing. I turn around the building. Can't see them in my rear view. I stop my car and park in front of the well-lit church doors, basically parked in the fire lane. I'm watching my rear view mirror, waiting for this car. I know it's back there, and it's going to drive around me. They'll see it was all just a misunderstanding. The SUV is there. It peeks around the building corner. They stop and wait a little bit before it turns towards where I'm parked. The SUV slowly drives by my car. They pass me slowly and I don't want to look at them. From my peripheral vision, I just see one outline in the driver's seat. As they pass me, I can feel this person's eyes on me and can see their head turning. I'm uncomfortable, but I don't want to start a conversation with them so I don't roll down my windows, and I do not want to look at them. I don't want to acknowledge them. I just want them to see that I'm not who they probably thought I was. They pass me completely, and the SUV starts to drive towards the exit of the parking lot, but then the SUV starts to circle around again, making a big loop around in the empty church parking lot. My body fills with dread. I'm actually scared now. I gave them the benefit of the doubt, but now they're coming back around. I don't want to know what they want anymore. When they start to circle back around, I take off out of that parking lot. But so do they. My car bottoms out and I speed down the street. So does theirs. The police station is way out near the countryside on the outskirts of town, but there's a police annex on this street. Sometimes there's cops parked out front. I know I'm just going to park there, and if they're still following me, I'll call 911. This car is following me, 100%. They've turned when I've turned, sped when I've sped, and as I turn my blinker to take a right into the annex, they turn left, and they're gone. I told my friends and family about this quickly after. No one I knew drove that kind of car. It was also an older model, so I don't think it could have been a rental. I don't know anyone who would do this to me and think it was funny. I did make a police report, but didn't get a license plate, so they couldn't do anything. I also know what kind of car it was. I would notice any older white SUVs for months after that. Never saw the exact car again. I'm glad you came out of that okay, OP, but I bet that moment when the situation changed from maybe they're following me to they're definitely following me was quite terrifying. Our final story was sent in by an anonymous viewer. 
My nickname in my family is Lucky. Explaining the pun would take too long, but the reason is because of something that happened when I was a young kid. My mum and I were coming home from the supermarket, driving down the motorway in heavy rain. The car spun out of control and we slammed straight into the metal barriers at the edge of the road. Not only did we both survive, but when we were cut free from the car, we were both more or less uninjured, aside from a few scrapes and bruises. According to the police who'd shown up at the scene, they'd never seen a car that wrecked where nobody was killed. This isn't directly relevant to my glitch in the Matrix, but it helps with a detail that will come up later. The glitch happened to me a couple of years ago. I was in high school at the time, 16 years old. In the UK we call this Year 11, and it's our last year of high school. We take our GCSE exams and either go free into the workforce or start the road to university, one way or the other. Add to that all of the usual teenage stresses and dramas, and the fact that a lot of relationships are becoming serious. Let's just say the age of consent here is 16 and you know what I mean by serious. And it's a lot of pressure in one school year. Little social things get blown out of proportion. Things seem life and death that very much aren't, including who's breaking up with who and what grades everyone's getting. One morning I woke up as normal, showered and went downstairs for breakfast. I was the last one down out of my family, that being my mum, dad, and brother, three years younger. Mum and my brother were talking together about some school project of his he was excited about, and dad was cooking and listening to the news on the radio. Looking back I think that was the first sign that I had an unusual day ahead of me but I didn't notice anything at the time. The whole breakfast was odd. I barely got any acknowledgement from anyone. It was as though we'd had an awkward falling out and I was being ignored. But as I said, I didn't pick up on it at the time, and even laughed off one incident where my brother and I were getting in the car, and he closed the door just before I could get in. The way it worked at our school was, we met in our form room for morning announcements, the form tutor read out the register, and for some reason my name didn't come up. My name begins with L. It's right in the middle and easy to skip over. When he got to the end I just said, I'm here too, sir. And he looked up, looked a bit confused and muttered something like, right, right, and ticked something off. Walking to my first lesson of the day I remembered my friends all chatting perfectly amiably, but not really including me. Not in a malicious way, but you know how a group can keep somebody out with body language. The first lesson was maths, which I remember because it was one of my best subjects and my hands-down favourite teacher. She also missed me off the register, and I pointed it out to her. Again, she seemed distant about it. I laughed about it with a friend who was in my form, but she didn't remember it happening at the beginning of the day with the form tutor. Strange. Throughout the day I kept not quite being noticed by anyone. A seat wasn't saved for me at lunch. Two other teachers missed me off the register or only remembered me right at the end, and my friends just didn't seem to want to talk much with me. By the time the day ended at 3.30 I felt pretty lousy. Honestly I was more concerned with my friends than the weird thing about the registers. What had I done wrong? That evening I got in and did a bit of homework before dinner. Dad was cooking as normal and I heard him call up the stairs that dinner was ready. I got downstairs and my brother's sitting down to my dad's famous mac and cheese. Side note, smoked cheese, oven baked, my dad's a culinary genius, along with my mum. And for some reason there was no plate for me. I didn't even say anything at that point. I just went to the kitchen to plate myself up a portion and sat quietly while we all ate. While my dad washed up and my brother dried, I noticed something strange. In the dining room there's a dresser with all the family photos, and they'd been changed around. There were some pretty recent photos of my brother, including his 13th birthday, which had only been a couple of months ago, but none of me anywhere like as recently. The weirdest thing and the only thing out of all of this that I just can't explain at all is the photo frame I'd never seen before. It was silver, or silvery at any rate, and in it was a photo of me, 
I must have been seven or eight. It was inscribed with my name, and at the top there was an engraved lettering saying something like, Always in our hearts. What a weird photo frame, right? Not by itself, but it's definitely the sort of photo frame you'd get for someone who died. I showed it to my mum and asked her why she'd chosen this frame. It would have been her, she's always been very sentimental. Our house is filled with photos for that reason. And she just looked at it, sadly. She didn't really look at me, she just said something like, Aw, you were so pretty. She handed me back the photo and got on with her evening. Normally I'd phone my best friend to talk about this weirdness, but she'd been giving me the cold shoulder so I didn't feel much like talking to her. I finished my homework and went to bed, drifting off to sleep with a book still in my hand. The next morning, my alarm goes off, and I drop the book as I wake up. I went downstairs for breakfast and immediately noticed that all the photos on the dresser were back to what they'd been a couple of days ago. I mean the photos I was expecting to see. My brother at his 13th birthday, me at my 16th, a lot of photos of me with our grandparents, and so on. That weird photo frame that made it look like I'd died was nowhere to be seen. I said to my mum something like, Oh, you got rid of it then? but she didn't seem to know what I meant. My friends were all fine with me, as though nothing was odd about the day before. I wasn't missing from any of the registers and everything seemed completely fine, and has been ever since. I put the whole thing behind me, until recently when I read all of these glitch in the matrix stories on Reddit, where some folks seem to have experienced parallel universes or time travel. I don't know what I think about all that, but Now I'm looking back on that day where I felt so unwelcome everywhere, like I wasn't meant to be there. I kept thinking about that photo frame, and that it was the most recent photo of me that I could find, around about the age that I survived a really bad car crash. If parallel universes are real, then there must be ones where my mum walked out of that accident, but I died. Was I experiencing some version of that reality? Or was everyone else glitching? My name was on the register, and my family weren't alarmed to see me. Obviously, they can't have really thought I was dead. My friends didn't spend the whole day saying, Who are you? when I tried to talk to them. So I can't have slipped through a wormhole or whatever, because I'd have been called out immediately. Can everyone else around me have glitched to the point where they sort of remembered both versions of reality at once? But if that's the case, why were the photos changed? Did the parallel family where I died all wake up in a house filled with photos of me as a teenager? And see my room filled with my things and freak out? Is my brother in another universe writing a post right now about how he briefly lived in a universe where his big sister hadn't died when he was five? I have no idea. Something weird happened to me. Or to everyone else around me, though. They don't remember anything about it from the few I've checked with. None of those explanations really fit since it can't have just been in my or everyone else's heads. The world was physically changed in some places, the photos, but not in others. I was still on the register, and my bedroom was my teenage bedroom. I'm open to any explanation at this point, up to and including that I'm literally insane, although this is the only time that I've ever experienced anything like this, and it was more than two years ago now. Just one of those things, I guess. Some of us are just lucky. Pardon the pun. Couldn't resist. Thank you for that strange tale, Anonymous. What do you think, dear ones? Could this young woman have glimpsed another life? Or is there a simpler explanation? The sun is rising, and the dawn chorus fills our ears. The jamboree is at an end once more. My thanks to everyone who sent in stories, or gave me permission to narrate theirs. Remember, I upload new stories on Mondays and Fridays, so be sure to subscribe and click the bell icon so you don't miss out. If you have any thoughts about the stories I've narrated, why not leave them in the comments below, and don't forget, if you enjoyed your time by the fireside, to pop the like button onto a skewer and melt it till it's bubbling. If you'd like a story of yours narrated, I have a submission form linked in the description, and I'd love to learn more of your creepy experiences and unexplained happenings. 
I will see you soon, dear ones, and until then, may your nights be dark and your dreams just a little curious.